uh, Jaina looked up to NHL players because those are the ones that she saw on TV. Because growing up, she didn't see herself. She didn't see many women playing hockey on TV. And she's one of the many women who's helped change that for the next generation. Many of you might remember back in the 2002 Olympics, game-winning goal scored by the woman right here. And she went on to win, it was four consecutive Olympic gold medals. And last night, it's been a very busy weekend, so we appreciate her being here. Last night, she was inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame. But that's not where her contributions to hockey, and especially women's hockey, end. It's really just the beginning, because she's also the commissioner of the CWHL, as she and many others continue to try and get women's sport in the forefront. So I'm pleased to introduce a Hockey Hall of Famer, and Brian Burke as well. That's a smile of someone who has two hours sleep, I would say. <laughs> yeah, we, we had a good time last night. <laughs> it's been, well, I, as you should have. That's a pretty special night. Hold your ring up so everyone can see it there. Maybe we get it on the camera. Yay. Hockey Hall of Fame. <laughs> There's not many of those uh, around. That's pretty special. Now, I will point out how many people in the room support women's hockey? That's bullshit. I go to the games and <laughs> no one's there. So the, the Furies are home this weekend. They're hosting the Calgary Inferno. I'll see how many of you are there. I'm bringing my daughters to the game. So I talked about Jana the other day on Hockey Night, and I said the champion. 11 titles just internationally, seven world championships, four Olympics. Let's go through the Olympics. So the very first... Olympics where women were allowed to play? Uh, 1998 in Nagano, so that was uh, my first Olympic Games. Uh, we came home with a silver medal. Fortunately, uh, lost to the Americans in the gold medal game. Uh, and then we followed that up in 2002 with our first Olympic gold and went on a run of uh, four consecutive gold medals, uh, 2002, 2006, 2010. So 2002 was Salt, Salt Lake, Lake City. 2006. In Torino. Torino. Yeah, 2010. 2010, Vancouver, of course. Or Vancouver, yeah. Vancouver. And so 2014, 2014. Sochi, yeah. And you were part of all four teams. I was. Okay, yes. so what were you known for? So your goal scoring, but what's your trademark? I know the answer, but you tell these folks. Uh, probably speed. I, was, I wasn't very big, so uh, and I had the, to be fast. And the backhand, I was And the backhand, of. yes, yes. Okay, so when did you figure out the backhand was a lethal weapon? Who taught you that? Well, growing up, uh, I had a coach, and I mentioned her last night in my speech, and she was my coach for almost 10 years, from the age of 10 to 18, and uh, she was a big believer in every single drill we did. We always did it on both sides of the ice. And if you were on your backhand side, you had to use your backhand. And if you were on your forehand, you had to use your forehand. And I think that that, uh, that was really important in, in making sure that I developed those skills. And it became my, my best shot. My backhand was probably better than my forehand, if you ask most of the people I played with. So um, it, it was a huge advantage for me. Uh, big trademark of yours. It's uh, like the poke check with Johnny Bauer. Yes. Everyone talks about you. They talk about your backhand. What was your favorite place of the seven world championships? What was your favorite tournament? Where the place where you played? It's always the best to play in Canada. Um, you know, you play in front of full arenas, and uh, when you have everyone, the stands full with red and white, uh, you can't beat that. So I had an opportunity to play in Kitchener, uh, Mississauga, Halifax, Winnipeg, a uh, number of great Canadian cities. Now, where is the women's game right now? Really, up until the last couple of years, it's really been two teams that play. In fact, the IOC at one point threatened to take women's hockey out of the Olympic Games. He backed down from that in a hurry. Um, what's going on in terms of funding and bringing up the quality of the women's program in other countries? Well, the women's game is growing dramatically in every country, and um, unfortunately, we don't see the gap closing as quickly because we're still getting so much better here and in the U.S. Uh, each year, each quadrennial, the game is dramatically different if you were to watch one gold medal game to the next. So, um, you know, the skill is, is better than it's ever been, the depth of players, and we're seeing that in our league now in the Canadian Women's Hockey League. We, we have so much depth. Uh, we have, I don't know how many Olympians, but we have about 75% of the Canadian and American Olympians who came back to play pro hockey are playing in our league, and they play every weekend, and they're extremely accessible and uh, great role models for the game. And, and finally, you're, you're the, not finally, you're the commissioner of the Canadian Women's Hockey League, um, and the players are being paid this year for the first time, thanks to the deal with the Chinese teams. Yeah, so last year was the first year they received uh, a stipend to play the game, and so that was a huge step uh, for the women. And 
but we know we have a long way to go. We need to continue to grow the game. And from a league point of view, um, we believe that there's huge growth potential. It's a really pivotal time for the women's game right now, I think, with the, the quality we have of, of players. And it's a time, I believe, to, to really take the game to the next level. I love it. I love watching women's hockey. And uh, I say to people, it's the same thing when we're talking about LGBTQ stuff. People say, well, I support the LGBTQ community, I'm like, are you in a gay straight alliance? Are you a member of PFLAG? Have you marched? Well, then you really don't support it. You might psychologically and morally endorse the cause, but buy a goddamn ticket if you support women's hockey. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's true. And I've played in games with the national team where we would have, you know, 16, 17,000 people, and a week later with 10 of the same players on the ice in league hockey, and you see friends and family, and. So part of it is maybe awareness, but at the same time, like you said, uh, we need people to come out to the games and, and show their support. We need people to jump on board sponsorship. We're trying to generate revenue. We, I believe that in order to grow the game, we've got to increase our revenues and our sponsorships and our partners. And that's kind of the goal is, is we need people to know our players and see them. Excellent. Now, there's two women's leagues. You won a title with both of them. You won a championship with the Canadian Women's Hockey League. You also won a championship with the National Women's Hockey League. Where does that stand? I know you've talked to the NHL. I was at one of the meetings about trying to merge them into one league and, and, and unify the, the, the effort. Where does that stand today? Uh, you know, it's, it's tricky. When I, when I was a player, I always believed that there should be one league. Uh, I wanted the best players all in one league, and I still believe that. And, and that's a place we have to get to. But what one league looks like is different to everyone. So whether that's a merger or whether that's a... a women's NHL or whether that's a just one pro league that's supported by the NHL it has a lot of different looks uh, ourselves and and the N National Women's Hockey League um, have very different models we're not for profit uh, they're a for-profit league I think you know potentially different end visions so it's not as simple as just merging two leagues together um, but we we are willing to talk we continue to look at different models and what we think might be sustainable um, and in the meantime we're also trying to run our own league so Every day we're trying to attract the best players to our league, but we're also looking at the future and how we can get together and make sure all the best players are in one league. Yeah, I think so. And I think, I know the NHL has made it clear they are more than prepared to support this financially, but they're not interested in a fractured situation. And I think the other league, the National Women's Hockey League has some litigation pending against it as well. So, but that's really the future is one league, wouldn't you think? Uh, absolutely, we have to get to a point where, where it's there. And um, as you said, the NHL believes in the women's game. The NHL, I think, uh, wants to get involved. And we're doing our job to make sure that we continue to run you know, the best women's pro league in the world and, and making sure that we're moving forward and we get to that point as soon as possible. Okay, so before last year when each player got a stipend, Tell the audience what life is like for an Olympian, for a Hall of Famer, in between Olympics. So six years ago, say, in between Olympics, mm -hmm. who were you playing for? So uh, for an Olympian, the three years in between, generally you're playing in the Canadian Women's Hockey League. I played for the Brampton Thunder, who uh, now have turned into the Markham Thunder. But uh, our players train, uh, you know, they usually have two practices a week and one or two games on the weekend. National team players will then skate an additional three times a week. Um, be in the gym four times a week, so it's it's a full time job. And um, but our league is really important because without the Canadian Women's Hockey League, all of our Olympians would have nowhere to train, nowhere to play. And what did you get paid when you played for Brampton? <laughs> Zero. Zero. <laughs> Zero. Now, yeah. can you imagine that, people in the audience? That's why I wanted you to go through it. These in between Olympics, these talented women play for nothing up until last year. Then last year, the Canadian Women's Hockey League made a deal with the Chinese team that came in, and there was a stipend paid to each player. These women play for nothing in between Olympics. It's ridiculous. It's gotta change. Yeah, and, and that's the goal as we continue to grow the sport. And we know that when we get to one league or, or as we professionalize our league, um, the women are not gonna make millions of dollars. Nobody's looking for, for an NHL, women's NHL, where the players are gonna make that kind of money, but. Well, that's my goal. <laughs> I'd love that, I but I, you know, I, I wanna see women make uh, a living wage to play the game, a respectable yeah. wage, and um, we know it's a, a long way away to get where the men are, and that's, uh, you know, but I, I think uh, the players deserve a, a good living wage. Yeah, I, certainly enough that they can, they don't have to have another job 
like I, I took the, the uh, Calgary Inferno women out for dinner last year before they went to the, the championship game. Not the Flames took them, I took them out. And they've all got at least one job, and most of them have two. So they're practicing and playing, not getting paid. They got a stipend last year. But before that, working as many as three jobs, one of them. It's yeah, crazy. It's, uh, you know, it's a pure form of the game. The, the women do it because they love the game, and they make the sacrifices. And uh, the other great part about it is that they, they know they're part of growing the game, and they do a lot outside of playing as well. Um, our, our players are very active in the community, and they make sure that they're making a difference where they're playing. And uh, again, they're doing it for nothing, but they're doing it because they love the game. So this great career, and at the end of it all, you have to go and marry an American. <laughs> Tell us about your partner. Well, uh, we're not married. I didn't go that far, but uh, no, we uh, we met through playing the game, and um, yeah, and yeah, we we played together in Brampton, and um, you know, you find you have common interests, and and kind of the rest is history. We have three amazing kids, and um, you know, I don't know if they'll be hockey players, but. I think uh, both of us just believe that if they can find a passion, um, as I sort of said last night, uh, I'll support in whatever that is because uh, that's what my family did for me. And um, when it wasn't the most common path, they, they encouraged me to follow that passion and I hope my kids will, will do the same. You said that in your speech last night, which was terrific, by the way. Um, question though, you told me one thing when we were talking before, when I phoned you, when you refused to call me back and finally I insisted. <laughs> I said, I'd like to talk to you before I that's do this interview. That's not true. <laughs> yeah, well, it is kind of true. You kind of blew me off for a couple of days. But that's okay. You're a big deal now, and I'm not anymore. So, um, But you did say one thing. When you were a kid, you dreamed of playing in the NHL, and your mom and dad never told you that was impossible. Tell, tell people in your own words. That's, I really liked it when you said that. Yeah, I, um, and as I, I said again last night, I said that uh, you know I grew up, what I saw was the NHL. I, I was a big Wayne Gretzky fan. Um, I was a big New Jersey Devils fan with growing up in Kingston, Ontario. I, uh, Kirk Muller was a big um, player for me and Doug Gilmore. So I saw those guys and that's what I dreamed to do was play in the NHL. And, um, and my parents and, and those closest to me never said, you know, that I wouldn't do that or they never told me that I couldn't or that, you know, there's maybe something else I should do because girls don't play hockey. And um, at the time, you don't realize how important that is. But when I look back now, uh, I realize that, that that was one of the very first real important lessons I learned. And I didn't even know I was learning it, but um, you know, I had the people, people closest to me allowing me to just dream. And, and they didn't try to shape that dream at all. They just allowed me to dream and they allowed me to follow the passion. Now, AJ Maletsko, who you know and have played against, mm -hmm. wonderful US skater, signed up for hockey as AJ so they wouldn't know she was a girl. And she'd show up for her first practice, and they'd say, what are you doing here? It's a boys' team. And she'd say, well, I'm A.J. Maletsko. So <laughs> she tells that story. It's great. You didn't have to do that in Kingston. Well, I, you know, I didn't have that story, thankfully. Um, I, I felt like I had a pretty good support system there. Um, but I know a lot, of, a lot of players had challenges. And um, I look at all the women that came before me, and, and some I had a chance to play with, and Angel James and Geraldine Heaney. And, and even beyond them, um, there was a lot of women that just weren't allowed to play the game, even if they wanted to. And so I feel fortunate that I had it a little bit easier than them. And I feel really proud that the young girls now have it uh, even easier than I did. So. Well, that's in large part due to you. Toughest player you ever played against? I don't mean physically tough, but hardest player to play against. Uh, probably Angela Ruggiero. We had some good battles. Uh, she's a Hall of Famer as well, um, but she was a defenseman and uh, big, strong, skilled. And myself being a, a winger, we ran into each other a lot and, and had some really good battles. And what was your favorite team you played on? Like you played on four gold medal teams. Mm. Everyone has a favorite team. Who was your favorite team? Um, that's really hard. Uh, well, I told you I was going to ask you that, uh, so you should have an answer. I know. It's, it's still hard, though. Um, you know, I think uh, 2002, uh, because we won the, the first gold medal there, we weren't expected to win. It was sort of a Cinderella story with our team. and a, uh, So I think that, and I'm going to give you another one. Um, in 2010, the Vancouver team, uh, we had a team that I think just had so much fun together and really sort of embraced the, the pressure that we had and also how fun and engaged Canadians were around the Olympics here. Yeah, that was crazy. I was there. We came out on the short end of that stick. <laughs> <laughs> After the Canadian referee kicked the puck to Jerome McGinley. Well, that's, yeah, the gold medal game. Um, who's the, the best player you've ever played with? 
I, I have to say probably uh, Mary Philippe Poulin. I think she's the best player in the world right now, and I had a chance to play with her uh, my last couple years. I played with her in my last Olympic Games, so that was pretty cool. That's very cool. Okay, last question, because we're almost out of time. Tell the audience a little bit about Haley Wickenheiser and what she's meant to women's hockey. Yeah, Haley um, obviously has been, uh, was the face for a long time, um, and she, she does so much for the game and growing the game, not only here in Canada, but she's done it around the world, and um, she's, a, she's been a big game player for us. She's been consistent for a long time, and um, I was fortunate to play with her for a long time, and uh, I'm sure if uh, I would put a lot of money down that she'll be inducted next year in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, I'm not sure. How long has she been out? you got to be out three years, don't you? She's been out three years. She's three yeah, years? I think so. And she's, she was going to medical school, but now she's doing something else, right? I don't know. It seems like she's got about ten she's, things going on. So it's I don't a, know if she's doing them all or, or it's not. It's impossible but. to keep track of <laughs> yes. her. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to say thank you to Hall of Famer Jane Hartford. Thank you. Thank you.